So many people are looking to live happier, more stress-free lives. We provide interviews from mental health experts across various fields because we know finding quality information isn't always easy. Let's find more sanity together. On today's episode, Dr. Michael Tompkins talks on the transdiagnostic conceptualization of treatment, which is focused on increased willingness to experiential approach. This approach can be found in his new book, The Anxiety and Depression Workbook, Simple, Effective CBT Techniques to Manage Moods and Feel Better Now. Dr. Tompkins is a clinical psychologist and board certified in behavioral and cognitive psychology. He is a co-director of the San Francisco Bay Area Center for Cognitive Therapy, assistant clinical professor at the University of California, Berkeley, diplomat and founding fellow of the Academy of Cognitive Therapy, and is a trainer and consultant for the Beck Institute. He's the author or co-author of numerous scholarly articles and chapters on cognitive behavioral therapy and related topics, as well as seven books. He has given over 300 workshops, lectures, and keynote presentations to national and international audiences, and has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and on television, such as the Learning Channel and Arts and Entertainment, and national and local public radio. He supervises medical students, postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, and provides consultation to professionals, and serves on the advisory board of Maga Nation Press, the Children's Press of the American Psychological Association. He is a recipient of the 1994 Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award by the California Pacific Medical Center, San Francisco, the 2005-2006 Distinguished Instructor Award by the University of California Berkeley Extension, and the 2013 Lifetime Achievement Award for Excellence in the Innovation, Treatment, and Research in the Field of Hoarding and Cluttering by the Mental Health Association of San Francisco. Now on to the interview. Hi, Michael. Thanks so much for coming on Sandy Podcast. I appreciate it. It is my pleasure, Jason. My pleasure. Um, so before we get into the meat of the interview, I like to ask people, um, what type of therapist are they? Like, what is your approach and what does therapy mean to you? Well, I'm a cognitive behavior therapist. Um, and what that means to me, I mean, there are a lot of people identify themselves as cognitive behavior therapists. Uh, but what that means to me is that I conceptualize cases from a cognitive model or perspective. And the assumption there um, is basically that it's not the things that trouble us, it's our view of things that trouble us. And so within that model, um, I actually work on cognitions and I also work on behaviors um, in the service of uh, influencing feelings and, and, and changing people's lives. Okay. And then by working on the cognitions and the behaviors, what is like the underlying change that you're trying to make to make people feel better? Well, the, uh, the way I think about change is, um, is the deepest change is, is behavioral change, uh, because that's where the deepest learning occurs. So many of my patients come in, particularly people with anxiety disorders, but also mood disorders, um, they, they, in their head, they know what they're thinking is unreasonable. Um, but in their gut, it still feels true. Mm -hmm. And the best example of that is, is like, um, years ago, I was doing a, a video on the cognitive behavior therapy for specific phobias. And I was working with a delightful, absolutely delightful young gentleman who had a dog phobia, I mean, a cat phobia. And as we were kind of doing a little bit of exposure in which he was actually touching around the, these photos of cats that I had brought, he, he, he was anxious, but he was trying to understand and he was sharing aloud when I asked him what was going through his head. He's saying to himself, this is ridiculous. I know a picture of a cat cannot hurt me. Why am I feeling so anxious? Mm -hmm. And while he knows in his head that a picture of a cat can't hurt him, in his gut, when he is exposed to the experience of interacting with, in this case, a photo of a cat, which triggers images and the experience of cats, in his gut, 
that doesn't feel true. And so in that, in exposure, in emotion exposure of all sorts, actually, we bring these two things together. We're trying to bring these two things together. What we know is true in our head to what begins to feel true in our gut. And when we actually understand and accept what we know true to be in our gut, then we actually will actually change our lives. Uh, because it's simply not sufficient to know in our heads what is helpful or true or accurate if we still believe it to be in, uh, accurate in our guts. Mm -hmm. And how does that process happen or, or the, the separation happen? So you were talking about these more top belief, surface belief, and I think everybody could relate to this where they know something is true, but deep down inside, they just it just doesn't feel like it's true and it creates fear and it changes their behavior and, and controls them like insecurities, imposter syndrome. How, where does that, the mechanism that causes that separation or looking at the other way, what brings them together? Well, I, I think one of the things that um, is, is true about emotional disorders across the board, whether we be talking about anxiety disorders or um, mood disorders, like a major depression is that a big part of what, uh, one of the principal maintaining variables in maintaining um, the emotional disorder is, is emotional avoidance. And so, uh, and when you avoid your emotional state, you can't learn some really important things uh, about not only the world, but about your emotional state uh, itself. And so in this patient, I'm talking to you about, you know, approaching cats. I mean, when you have a specific phobia, you don't approach cats and you don't really, uh, the way to think about it is I think more helpful. And I think Michelle Krask is speaking to this in terms of, um, inhibitory learning is that it's not so much the cat, it's the, the experience the cat triggers and that that negative experience is what we avoid. And when we avoid negative experiences, uh, we don't learn some important things. So if we avoid cats, because we have a cat phobia, we don't learn things about cats, we don't learn things about what is normal cat behavior. Uh, we don't learn how likely or unlikely it is that a cat's going to jump up on our lap and scratch out our eyes. But most importantly, what we don't learn is that we can handle the emotional experience itself. Because if you don't believe you can handle an emotional experience, then you will avoid it. Um, and, uh, and part of that is actually how we think about our emotional experiences when we think about them. Um, people without emotional disorders uh, typically believe that they can handle these emotional experiences and therefore there's no reason to avoid them. Got it. Um, and you recently uh, wrote a, uh, a book, a, a manual um, talking about this, this, I don't want to say approach to treatment because a lot of people take it, but to help people in order to have more experiential approach. Yes. Thank you, Jason. This is the title is like the anxiety, anxiety and depression workbook. This is for adults. It's published by New Harbinger. It should be coming out in the spring. Hmm. And this is basically a transdiagnostic model um, a la David Barlow's work. Um, and, but I, I'm, I'm really emphasizing the role of um, emotional avoidance in the maintenance of emotional disorders. So, so uh, and sometimes people say, well, how, you know, how can uh, emotion exposure work with someone with a major depression? And actually, we do emotion exposures with people with major depression. For example, people with major depression avoid their depressed state. Um, and so they withdraw. And so when we start doing emotion exposures, one of the kinds of emotion exposures we do is a positive, um, a pleasant activity scheduling. So when you're depressed, you actually withdraw and avoid pleasant activities um, because you have all kinds of thoughts about, you know, about your, your mood state in general. I'm, I'm too depressed to do it. I'm too tired to do it. Uh, what's the point? It won't, you know, I won't enjoy it. You have all kinds of thoughts about your emotional state. 
And so we actually start actually scheduling pleasant activities or mastery activities. Um, and to get the person to actually approach their, their, their depression, that, that, that those feelings, and then they, they learn. Or graded task assignment. We break a task down to help the person feel less overwhelmed and more willing to approach a task that triggers their, emo, uh, their, their major depression. Similarly, people with major depression will avoid positive experiences depending upon how they think about those positive experiences. So if you start talking with someone about, you know, doing a pleasant activity like, you know, uh, going out um, for a walk with a friend, they might have a thought like, you know, I'm a horrible mom. What's, what's, uh, how can I possibly go out and enjoy myself when I'm not really the kind of mom I should be with my children? Mm -hmm. So emotional experience uh, avoidance is at the core of maintaining emotional disorders. Um, the way I think about it is that when you have an emotional disorder, what you have is an emotional system that is inflexible, meaning that you tend to actually think about things in the same way. You tend to attend to things in the same way. You attend to some things, you ignore others, and you tend to act um, in the same way toward your emotional state, which is largely avoidance or trying to control your emotions. And so what the first step, and this is what I outline in the, in the workbook, and if you work with cognitive therapists, you'll see this, is the first step is to enhance the flexibility, the emotional flexibility, uh, so that people are more willing to actually approach these negative emotional states. And once they start approaching these negative emotional states, then the deep learning begins where they start to learn something very, very important about emotion in general and, per, and in particular their emotions. In hmm. So it sounds like on the anxiety side of things, um, one thing we talk about is this risk resource model. So with anxiety, it's an overestimation of a risk or threat and underestimation of ability to, hand, to handle that threat or handle your, um, I think maybe more importantly, what we're talking about here is handle the emotions that you're going to feel if you come mm -hmm. across the thing that you're scared of. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like with anxiety, what you're saying is that it's really having faith that you could actually handle your emotions and learning that you could actually tolerate them. Whereas right. in depression, Depression, it's having them um, do the things that do things that they're avoiding because of the negative affect that they're having or the negative self-talk that they're having that's going to make them feel bad while they're doing it. Exactly. Is, is that correct? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the ways that I the kind of story that I use to explain a little bit of this about how this works for us as human beings is. Uh, with patients, it's like if imagine that you have two people who are standing in line to get their flu shots. Both are going to get the same flu shot, but one guy standing there and thinking, "Oh my God, I this is going to hurt, and I simply will not be able to tolerate the pain that I'm going to experience." The second guy knows he's going to get the same flu shot and he knows it's going to hurt, but he's thinking about the flu shot and the pain in this way. He's thinking, yeah, it's going to hurt, but you know, I can handle the pain. I can handle worse pain than I'm probably going to feel in that flu shot. Now, while both of those individuals are going to experience pain, each of them is going to feel, one of them is going to feel more anxious about encountering the pain, right? And it's because they are underestimating their ability to cope which then overestimates the impact of that emotion mm. or, or the, in this case, the pain. And so many times when you're looking at the risk resource model, you're, you're really working not only on the risk side of things, particularly for anxiety disorders, but I think more importantly, whether it be anxiety disorders or, or mood disorders, you're working on the resource side of things, people's belief about coping with negative affect, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, all of that, you know, looking at, you know, uh, how people uh, um, evaluate risk, but also how people evaluate um, their ability to cope, all of those um, we work on in the service of getting people to approach negative affect, whether it's anxiety disorder or a mood disorder like major depression. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thinking about rumination, you know, when people are, are thinking over and over about whatever it is that's bothering them, right? Um, that's not necessarily the most adaptive state. Um, so, but how is that different? That you know, someone might be sitting here saying, well, I approach my emotions all the time. I can't get it out of my head. And no matter how much I try not to think about this, it's stuck and I'm spinning on it. You know, wouldn't that be experiential, uh, emotional or experiential approach? That would be experiential avoidance, right? Um, current conceptualizations of rumination um, uh, assume that, you know, rumination is a mental action, you know, and it is a mental action. And then the function of that mental action is to try to control negative affect, right? And so to that end, it's a maintaining variable in maintaining, you know, a negative, negative affect or, or, or depression. So, you know, when we are working on with an, an individual with major depression who is engaged in rumination, which they all are, what we're trying to do is to teach them skills to um, dampen out or to shift a rumination like that to more adaptive action. So that, that's a mental action. But mm -hmm. like you're saying, Jason, people are just spinning and spinning. And oftentimes rumination like that is all about why rumination? Why am I feeling so down? Why did I screw up? Why, why, why? Versus how, uh, which is the more adaptive form of rumination where we actually identify a problem and then we move into how do I minimize my exposure to the problem? If that happens again, and develop a and develop a solution, a viable solution to that problem, um, but asking yourself why, why, why is classic rumination. Mm. Well, and then also anxiety. It, it, there's also the rumination of what will, right? Yeah. Will this happen? Will this not happen? Um, this is, so for those people that are that are more on the anxiety side that are saying the what will, what will, or is the scary thing going to happen, or is the bad thing going to happen? What would be the more adaptive approach there? Well, the same in worry, worry is maladaptive problem solving, really. So when we all worry and the, and the function of worry is to develop a plan to moderate our exposure to the potential threat or danger. So worry is all about something bad that could happen that hasn't happened yet. That's mm. what worry is. It's all about the future. And so, uh, and when it's working, you know, and we anticipate a problem, a potential problem, we develop a plan, you know, uh, to moderate our exposure to that, that, that challenge or that threat were it to happen. When we do that, worry has done its job. When you have an anxiety disorder, you continue to worry as if that's the solution, actually. And it, it, is, it is not the solution. The solution would be a plan to actually implement were it to, hap were it to happen. And so uh, a lot of times, again, worry is kind of a mental action. And many of the interventions for generalized anxiety disorder are really also targeting you know, those, that tendency to actually worry um, to uh, avoid uh, experiences. You know, and, you know, conceptualizations of worry as an avoidance strategy is that if you're worrying about whether you're going to be late or not, you, you, you're not really worrying about the deeper fear that you might be, be late and then be fired and humiliated in your workplace, right? Mm -hmm. um, people aren't worrying about that. They're not even interacting with that because that engenders a much stronger emotional experience. What they're doing is they're trying to control that experience by, by worrying, which is like skating a, across the top of that actual deep fear. Hmm. And what about worry about things that you actually can't problem solve? Like, um, you know, maybe someone with OCD is worrying all day about them and their family catching COVID or somebody's worried about being, um, you know, dumped by someone like somebody's going to break up with them is a common thing people worry about. Like this worry where there's not necessarily a a concrete problem solving because the problem is a little bit more nebulous or or maybe ongoing. Well, with, particularly with OCD, the the the. Uh, and this is true in GAD, mm -hmm. really 
when what you get to is a point where you have a potential solution, but you're not certain it's the right solution or you're not certain it will work. Hmm. Right. Or in OCD, sometimes you have, uh, well, you have potential problems in the future that um, are uh, very, very, very unlikely yet they're possible. And so, in any solution to a problem, the best use of, of thinking about a solution is to develop a solution for a likely negative outcome. There's not much value in designing a solution to a problem that is really not likely to happen, right? So it would be like, what is my plan to, uh, for the possibility that I'm going to be on a plane that's going down, all right? First off, I don't know what the plan would be, all right, for that. Um, but spending a lot of time worrying about it um, is not very helpful. What would be more helpful is what would be, you know, my plan if, uh, if there's a more likely outcome, which is that, you know, there's some mechanical problem for the plane on the tarmac and I'm late to my next appointment, you know? So that actually is more likely to happen. And so developing a, a, a plan to handle that is more useful. But also what's really relevant about what you're, the question, which is probably more relevant based upon what we were talking about is that actually when it comes to something like OCD or GAD, the real problem is people don't believe they can handle the distress or the experience of not being certain. Hmm. Right? That is fundamentally the problem. If you believe you can tolerate the experience that comes with not being certain, you won't feel compelled to try to close the loop, try to escape uncertainty. So a big part of that is the individual's attempt to escape uncertainty because if they can escape uncertainty, they'll feel more comfortable. But people without OCD or people without GAD, they believe they can handle this experience of not being certain. And so they don't feel compelled to try to escape it. So, you know, so we, we kind of covered two major forms of experiential avoidance. One was more behavioral, like, you know, not not doing things um, or avoiding doing things or avoiding things that you're scared of. And, and the other one, which is rumination. Uh, is there any other major form of experiential avoidance that you talk about in your book or that people should be aware of? Well, there basically are two types of experiential avoidance. One is avoiding the trigger altogether that triggers the experience. And the other broad class is uh, once you're triggered, what you do to try to control that experience or dampen that experience or escape that experience. And so those are the, like the two categories. And then I guess a third category uh, would be what we might call protective signals or safety signals, right? Which actually <clears throat> does influence this other thing that we have about, you know, evaluating relative safety you know, a, a, of a particular situation or even an experience. And so, uh, and so protective signals are the things people like carrying around, you know, uh, a couple of Xanax tabs when you fly or even like an empty Xanax bottle or, uh, or, you know, these, you know, they're like talismans that people carry not. And if you talk with them, They'll tell you in their head, they know that it doesn't make any sense because they never take the Xanax or what is an empty bottle of Xanax going to actually do for them? And the truth of the matter is, is that they, they feel more comfortable, right? And therefore, that, and, and better able, if you will, to, to tolerate a lower experience. But if they believed, again, that they could handle whatever that experience is, then carrying a, pr a protective signal is they would go, well, what, what's the point of that? I can handle this experience as I'm having it in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, 
And when we were talking um, before, you had, you know, made two broad processes that, that you talked about, which was the one that we've been talking about in detail here, which is the experiential approach. But the other part of it that you talked about was willingness and willingness yeah. being the first factor. And then you have the approach and it's not just one than the other, but they're there. But the willingness um, to approach is highly important as well. Yes. Thank you, Jason. I. Oh, when I teach, I talk, I talk with uh, clinicians about this a lot. Um, when I think about all the interventions that we use, I see pr them primarily as willingness interventions, meaning trying to enhance the person's willingness to approach their negative experiences. So for example, you know, if you look at the inhibitory li uh, uh, learning literature, hierarchies would be contraindicated. And, right? and uh, just explain, well, what does the hierarchy even mean? Well, a hierarchy is kind of, uh, uh, you, you build a ladder that the, the patient kind of rank orders from least anxiety evoking or least uh, um, to most anxiety evoking in the treatment of anxiety disorder. And then they select an area to actually start approaching these experiences. So it might be, you know, like if you had a dog phobia, a person with a dog phobia it might be the lower steps might be looking at photos of dogs. Higher steps actually might be uh, letting a dog jump on and off your lap and then lots of steps in between. Now, the inhibitory learning literature would say, well, actually, hierarchies actually are probably contraindicated to real inhibitory learning, um, which I completely understand uh, uh, the theory, that, that point of the theory. The, the, the thing about a hierarchy, though, um, and there are ways, you know, to, to work with people, but the, the advantage of a hierarchy is that if you map out the path and the person has some in, uh, influence over where they start, then it, they're more willing to approach their, their anxious uh, experience. So, you know, someone who is saying, oh, well, I can do that, you know, yeah, it's on a... Uh, you know, a, a 20 on a 100 scale. Yeah, I can do a 20. I can handle that experience. So they're then willing to do the, expo the emotion exposure, learn, oh, I handled the experience, which then enhances their willingness to try the next step, right? So, and, uh, and like cognitive interventions, I see cognitive interventions as being able to, you know, shift people's point of view enough that they're willing to actually approach their negative experiences by changing their behavior. So obviously when you're doing cognitive restructuring, the thing that cognitive therapists love to hear from their patients is, gee, I never really thought about that before. You know, Absolutely. I never really thought about it that way before. Now you've done, you've influenced what they know in their head, but you actually haven't radically influenced what they believe in their gut. Right. But because now, hmm, gee, I really never thought about that before. Perhaps I'm willing to actually do this, you know, and see what happens. Uh, so other things like behavioral experiments are wonderful examples of um, kind of like using an individual's natural curiosity to test out what they believe to be true in their gut, right? So it's a willingness intervention. So uh, graded task assignment, willingness intervention. Okay, if we break it down, I'm willing to start here and move up. So, and it's all willingness to approach a negative experience and be with that negative experience. And that's how I see everything that I do. And much of that is based upon, you know, Bandura's work on like self-efficacy, you know, that belief that we have that, um, I have the, the, uh, the belief I had the skills and knowledge to achieve a desired outcome, right? So all these interventions are really targeting like the belief, oh gosh, now I have a skill. Now I have some knowledge that will help me with the desired outcome, which is actually to approach my negative experience. Okay, I'm willing to approach my negative experience. And so I just see it as all working around willingness, um, and then, of course, you know, motivational interviewing is around willingness. I mean, lot, most, I can't think of actually anything I do that isn't targeting willingness. 
And some of those interventions you mentioned, just to break them down. So cognitive restructuring, and, and please add on anything that I'm leaving out, is when we look at people's thoughts and beliefs and we evaluate the evidence for and against through it could be various different ways to see how true that belief is. And mm-hmm. maybe it is true and it could should be kept and maintained, but you know, uh, oftentimes the, the belief might be overly negative or overly scary, or there might be some biases in the thinking and the person comes to a new, a new belief. Um, behavioral experiments, we had talked um, on this podcast before, but just quickly to recap, um, the person believes something will happen. We ask them to do the behavior a few times uh, to see if it actually happens or not. And, you know, so uh, a very simple one, if I pet a dog, it will bite me. A behavioral experiment might be (laughs) go pet the dog and see if it actually bites you. Or um, if I go to, uh, say, a Starbucks and I wait online and I take too long to order, everybody behind me is going to like scoff and and be rude to me. Okay, well, why don't we wait there for 30 seconds, see what happens, behavioral experiment. They might also, they might also dub as, as exposures though, uh, the ones that mm-hmm. I said. Mm-hmm. And then the exposures mm-hmm. is doing um, what you're scared of. And then the gradated task assignments, gradated means slowly building up, that we we break it down into small pieces and we have um, a low, easy entry point and then we build it up from there. Yeah, and I um, see those, uh, those behavioral interventions as, you know, emotion exposures. And behavioral experiments are, are, are really wonderful. I, um, and some of the experience, experiments that I think are most powerful for people are to test out their beliefs about their ability to cope with a negative experience. Hmm. You know, even like in social anxiety or social phobia, many individuals, uh, many patients that I work with will, will tell me that if they make a social mistake, they know no major horrible thing is going to happen other than they will feel intensely embarrassed. Okay? And that they then avoid these, they avoid these settings because, and avoiding the experience because they believe they can't handle the state of embarrassment. If it only takes a couple of times in my life to have done really embarrassing things to know while that is most unpleasant, I can handle feeling of embarrassment. And so even like in, in that, often you get into kind of working around this belief, pe- these beliefs people have about their ability to cope with negative experiences. And in this case, the negative experience of embarrassment, which is most unpleasant, right? The other thing that is a willingness intervention that I wanna add also too, is that something like psychoeducation is a willingness intervention. You know, You could see it as a cognitive restructuring intervention But if you look at it more broadly, it's like, okay, well, if I provide someone with information, new information, perhaps they'll be more willing to do this or perhaps more willing to do that. Right. Um, So, you know, you know, even psychoeducation really is targeting willingness. And so for me, when I'm working with someone, I'm always thinking ahead in terms of like, how can I get this person to be willing to change their behavior, change their behavior? And, um, and that's the, most of my work is all around willingness intervention. Hmm. Um, and, and it just popped in my head when you were talking that another way of avoidance is actually a lot of time we think of avoidance, we think of lack of something, taking something away, but oftentimes it could be adding something like being overprepared or proofreading something five times, Mm -hmm. or, you know, um, if you have a presentation, memorizing it to make sure that there's no way of making a mistake, because that's an avoidance because you're avoiding the fear of messing up. Exactly. Exactly. And avoiding, avoiding the experience of thinking about messing up or avoiding the experience of not being certain whether you're going to mess up or not, right? But either way, it's a negative experience. And people, that's, those are really good examples of how people will use strategies to kind of control the intensity of their experience. Right? And people with emotional disorders do have more intense uh, emotional experiences than people without emotional disorders. So, you know, there's the you know, biologic piece that comes comes to bear too is where people are kind of born with, you know, a vulnerability to actually feeling, having more intense negative states that do not uh, dampen as quickly uh, as someone without an emotional disorder. Someone without an emotional disorder, same trigger 
less intense emotional state, and it dampens more quickly. And so they come into life having more intense emotional experiences. And so that belief is true, actually. They do have more intense emotional experience. The other belief that's true is that, and once I'm triggered, once I'm anxious, it takes me a heck of a long time for my anxiety to dampen out relative to my friends or other family members, which is also a, a belief that's true. So they come into this, but because of, uh, uh, of the quality uh, of these emotional, negative emotional experiences, they avoid them or they try to control them. And that over a lifetime enhances the belief and strengthens the belief that I simply cannot handle these experiences. Okay? And that belief is really what maintains it. And once people, uh, once through treatment, people actually change that belief to a belief that's like, yeah, these are most unpleasant experiences, but it's not the end of the world. I can handle them. Then the paradox is that that belief actually feeds back into their emotional experiences and they actually have uh, less intense emotional experiences mm -hmm. that are dampened more quickly. You know? So uh, again, it's really targeting this belief about ability to cope you know, with negative emotion um, that we all experience, you know? I mean, every day we have a neg negative emotion. We have positive emotions too. We have negative emotions as well. Um, it, so it sounds like what you're saying is that when it comes to anxiety and depression disorders, the, the really painful thing that causes most of the distress is that belief, I, I can't cope or I can't handle it. Right. And, and that's what gets triggered by the negative affect state. Or, or I mean, yeah. stimulus, whatever, whatever triggers it. And then that is a huge, a huge portion. So really what we're working on is trying to shrink that portion of it. That's and right. if we shrink that portion of it, then people are in a healthier, more adaptive state. That's right. Um, you can, you can, I'm sure hear uh, as I'm describing it, that this is a cognitive model, right? You know, we're working on cognition in the service uh, and changing behavior then feeds back into the belief about coping, right? So if we can change behavior, but all that upfront stuff that we do is in the service of increasing person's willingness to actually change their behavior. But once they start to change the behavior, then that begins to challenge and change the belief that they can't handle these negative emotional states. Mm -hmm. And then that feeds back into that belief that then dampens their anticipatory anxiety, for example, um, which then makes it easier for them to go into a situation and remain in the situation. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, it, well, there's a feedback loop too. Yeah. increase willingness, increase experiential approach, which increases willingness because mm -hmm. you realize you could handle it and, and people spiral almost like snowball in the right direction rather than the That's wrong exactly direction. Right. And we've but, all had that experience, Jason. I mean, you know, things happen. You know, I, 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 I don't avoid the experience. I have the experience. And then, you know, if I think, well, that wasn't so bad, you know? And so maybe I'll do it again, right? That wasn't so bad, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I'll do it again, right? And that is exactly what we're talking about. You know, maybe yeah. I'll try it again. Well, then also think about the flip side. We could see how disorders <laughs> get worse because it could snowball and spiral down mm -hmm. the other direction as well, where, where you have that, the feedback loop going in the, in the wrong direction. Yeah, I mean, you can have experiences which well, reinforce the belief that person can't, can't handle it. And, um, and oftentimes, interestingly, I'm sure you've heard this from your patient, but often when you, when you actually talk with someone about what is the evident, objective evidence that they can point to that, uh, is in, that confirms the belief that they can't handle their experience, they'll point to, oh, when I was feeling when I was feeling really really anxious driving on the freeway, I took the exit. All right, that was proof that I can't handle my emotional experience. And and of course, what we would say to them is that I'm not sure you actually did that experiment. You know, what actually does an experiment look like to test the belief you can handle an experience if you choose to escape it? You know, is that really an accurate test? Is that a really accurate test? 
No, no, it's not. But oftentimes that's what people will point to as evidence of like why I can't handle it. And of course, if you have an anxiety disorder or a mood disorder, you're escaping your emotional state all the time, right? And so then you're building this case. Oh, well, I can't handle it because I escaped it or because I avoided it. Mm -hmm. And so it's the avoidance and the escape and the controlling actions that build this case for people. I can't handle my negative emotional state. Not, but it's actually not true. Why would, again, psychoeducation, why would mother nature, why would we develop emotional emotions that we simply can't handle? What's the evolutionary advantage of that? There's no evolutionary advantage to that at all. Yeah. Um, you know, when we're talking about, uh, or, or when you're talking about the experiential approach, or we're talking a lot about learning something like learning that you could cope, learning, uh, that you could tolerate what happens, learning what the outcome is going to be. Um, this might be getting a little bit in the weeds, but do you think habituation, uh, plays a role in here? Just the, just the idea of the, of the affect dropping by having the experience, or do you think that's all caused by the learning? I, uh, because of the way I conceptualize case cases, um, I believe that uh, really deep sustained change happens when we change beliefs, right? And I mean, <clears throat> I'm not a researcher or certainly not an expert on emotion theory. You know, people like Michelle Krask and Stefan Hoffman, these are experts. Um, but I, in my observation of people uh, in CBT, what I do notice is that people's beliefs um, are present and those are what I'm really working with. And even in behavioral experiments, I think the power of a behavioral experiment, unlike, you know, uh, if you kind of like Think about someone who I guess is purely behavioral and perhaps has a habituation model um, that, you know, the way I think about it is like if you're a true behavioralist and you think about habituation, it's not like you might, you wouldn't say that there isn't any cognitive change, you know, absolutely. but, but you might say, but the cognitive change comes along for the ride, right? You know, that actually when people actually do exposures, that comes for, along for the ride. Whereas in a cognitive model, in particular with behavioral experiments, we make the we make the beliefs that we're testing more explicit, and so the person is explicitly testing a belief uh, ahead of time, rather than you know waiting for it to come along for the ride. And I find that to be more uh, rewarding for me, and I think it's more rewarding for my patients because it's clear about what we're working on. We're working on a belief you have that may be true, that may not be true. Um, so, uh, and again, that I'm sure comes from the way I conceptualize cases, but I, I find that's why I really love behavioral experiments because you so explicitly um, uh, identify the belief for the person to test out. And even with behavioral experiments, some of the most powerful behavioral experiments I have done with people is not is testing out the outcome, uh, which is about uh, like, you know, uh, learning something about your emotion, emotional reactions. Will it be as high intense as you predict? Will it last as long as you predict? Will you actually be able to cope with it or not? And what does coping with it look like? And did you do that or did you do the opposite of that, right? Mm -hmm. And those are very powerful interventions for people. Uh, and most of these beliefs that you're talking about, and you just looped back before, are going to be self-efficacy beliefs, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. how do you, so you're, you're in session, you're working with somebody and, you know, if somebody's sitting here and they're, they're a potential patient or potential somebody that, that wants to go into therapy, how would you help someone find out what these self-efficacy beliefs that they're having are to help them test it? Well, we, you know, the typical um, uh, techniques we use, like downward arrow would be an example, you know, David Burns downward arrow, you know, 
uh, and then what happens and then what happens if that were true and then what happens and if that were true and then what happens but also just like at, you know socratic dialogue you know so it sounds like you know um you what i hear you saying is that you don't believe you can actually do this because you're too depressed why do you believe that you know do you believe that for everyone uh, have you been depressed before? How did you get out of your depression? Did that look a little bit like you actually going toward and doing things, you know, even when you were depressed? Asking those kinds of questions, you know, uh, which uh, to actually identify those. Oh, and again, if I could say is like, like even Socratic or collaborative empiricism or Socratic dialogue are willingness interventions. It just is like, okay. Perhaps we can examine this together and you'll be more willing working as a team to explore some of these thoughts with me. You know, would you be willing to do that? Um, and then maybe we could explore what this might look like for you changing your behavior. Could we do that too and collaboratively examine what you believe to be true? Hmm. Um, and, and you talked a, a lot about willingness techniques, like techniques in, in now. Are they always like dovetailed, like a behavioral experiment or any of these techniques you're talking about is that you're doing it in such a way in order to increase their willingness to change their behavior. So it's a bit, it's a bit of both, right? Mm -hmm. You're doing the intervention with the idea that that intervention is going to directly cause them to approach whatever they're scared of. Is there anything that is just a experiential approach technique or is it always this merged? Like I these techniques it, are merged. Um, I find it merged. And I, this is a really great question because uh, really, cognitive therapy is an interact, inter interactive, iterative process, meaning that because what you're really, when you're looking, what you're really doing is watching for willingness to drop. And if you, for example, if, you're, if you notice willingness, if I notice willingness drop, I might move more back into cognitive restructuring. Right. Or I might move back into psychoeducation. Oh, perhaps there's something else. Or I might use a metaphor. Right. And then I, I work with a person, try to get their willingness to increase again. And then we try to do, move into a behavioral experiment or, you know, like homework, non adherence is a willingness problem. It's a willingness problem in the way, and we can design homework assignments that can help people be more willing to try them. But when they come back and tell us that they didn't, then we want to find out what are the cognitions, what beliefs came up when you thought about doing the homework assignment that got in the way of you being willing to do it. And so we would move back into working on these non-adherence beliefs or automatic thoughts, and then, uh, oh, and help them there, and then hopefully move them into more willingness. Okay, are you willing to kind of try it again? Um, or even like, you know, that uh, how we rate confidence level, which is most definitely self-efficacy. You know, how confident are you in the uh, zero to 100% in, in, uh, that you, you will do this homework assignment as we designed it? 80%. Oh, well, let's go back to the homework assignment and maybe, you know, Look at it again and see if we can tweak it a little bit so that you can come back and say, now I'm 90% plus confident that I can do it. And then I'm more willing to try it. So, so all those interventions are all moving back, targeting willingness. And then once willingness is increased a bit, moving back into behavioral experiments or, or behavior change. And then if there's some balking about behavioral change, moving back into these interventions to help with willingness. So it's always like this. You know? mm -hmm. And I think, it, I mean, I, I actually don't understand how anyone could do anything other than that. You know, I, I, I don't meet that many patients who come to me and want help. And I say, well, the thing to do is to change your behavior. Just do this, this, and this, and you'll be fine, right? I don't run into too many patients like that. Maybe other people do. I do not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so which means by definition, we're going back to willingness, starting with willingness and moving into behavior change, back to willingness, moving to behavior change. Yeah relative to a person's willingness to change their behavior. Yeah. And that's a great point. Cause if people were willing to just do the change, they know they would need that they need to make, then they probably wouldn't be coming in exactly. um, for treatment in the first place. Patients come in and told you, 
I know what to do. Mm -hmm. I know what to do that will help me. I'm just having trouble doing it. And you go, absolutely. And you know what? I can help you with that. Mm -hmm. Because it's a willingness problem. And, and can you give an example uh, like of a cognitive restructuring like for, for willingness? And it could be for a specific disorder or something, just for people to hear about what this, like if they were sitting down with you, what would this even sound like? What would it look like being in treatment and someone trying to increase willingness more from the cognitive side? Well, if I was doing it, it would depend upon the belief, but I would do it just the way we all do it, which is, okay, let's identify the belief. Um, I don't really think I can do that. You know, I'm too depressed to do that. Okay. How strongly do you believe that? Zero to 100. All right. Um, when you believe it that strongly, I mean, how does that make you feel? How intensely depressed do you feel when you think about, when you have the thought that I am too depressed to do it? Does that help you feel less depressed, more depressed? Then we kind of move into, okay, where's evidence that you actually can't handle, can't do this uh, and face depression, you know, while you're depressed, what evidence do you have that would disconfirm that you can't do this while you're depressed? Okay. And then re reevaluate strength of the belief and, you know, uh, and the, the strength, the intensity of the effect. That's what we would look like. But the key in that is to identify the self-efficacy belief that you're, mm -hmm. that you're targeting, you know, and it's like, I don't believe that I can do that feeling as depressed as I am. So help me feel less depressed and then I'll do it. Well, of course we know that that's actually backwards. Yeah. You know, it's backwards. We have to, it's necessary for us to change our behavior in the face of that emotion to learn that we can handle that emotion. And as we learn, we can hand, do this while we're depressed. We're more willing to do that a little bit more while we're depressed. And interestingly, when we do that, we start to feel less depressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, you, if you're waiting to feel better to make change, it might, it might take a while. That's absolutely right. And a lot of times people come in, that's what they come in for, you know, help me do this, but not feel what I'm uh, feeling. So like the they come in with different solutions to the problem. Their solution is help me not feel this experience. Mm -hmm. And my solution is, well, I'm going to help you feel this experience in the service of changing your behavior. Because once you start changing your behavior, you're going to change your life. Hmm. And, I, and I should have fielded this uh, question before when you said the, the word transdiagnostic. Mm -hmm. uh, but what do you mean by that? Transdiagnostic means that, you know, the assumption um, that there are certain factors that um, uh, uh, maintain emotional disorders. And we've talked about a number of these factors. And one of them is emotion avoidance. And emotion avoidance is, uh, and people have continual emotion avoidance because they have inflexible emotional systems, right? And so the assumption is it doesn't really matter what the diagnosis is, whether it's an anxiety disorder or whether it's panic disorder. Uh, um, or whether it's major depression, <clears throat> the same factors maintain it. And we target those factors and the person will improve. And if you look at transdiagnostic models, you know, at the heart of transdiagnostic di models are emotion exposure. This um, exposing yourself, stepping into that experience and learning from that experience um, so that you're more willing to step into that experience again. Hmm. And so wh which disorders would, would fall across these trans, uh, trans across this trans diagnostic model? Well, like all the anxiety disorders, um, certainly major depression, uh, dysthymia would be examples of that. Hmm. <clears throat> um, OCD, although it's not an anxiety disorder, again, the, the, there are many of, they share many of the same OCD shares, many of the same mechanisms of emotion avoidance. Um, and, uh, emotion driven actions to escape. And so those would be the ones that are targeted in, in the trans diagnostic protocols. Mm. And how about trauma like PTSD? Uh, not, not too much. The, uh, um, at least in my read of the trans, di trans diagnostic models. But again, um, I, I think that that that's true that individuals with PTSD, for example, are um, avoiding the experiences that are triggered by memories of the trauma. Um, and then they engage in all kinds of 
uh, avoidance, uh, emotion avoidance strategies. Um, they also have interesting beliefs <clears throat> about trauma that decreases their willingness to approach these experiences, you know, and, um, um, and so I, I think that you could certainly make the argument, even though it's not, well, it's not in the protocol, I would borrow this protocol, um, uh, I certainly s see it as similar. Hmm. Okay. Um, and a anything else about this framework that you've written in your book that we didn't cover today that you think is, is important for people to know about? No, I think we've covered it. I mean, it's, it's like people come in with, um, you know, uh, a, a biologic vulnerability, for example, of a very sensitive emotional system. They have some experiences that gets triggered. They move into emotion avoidance. That emotion avoidance starts to uh, reinforce emotion inflexibility, the inflexibility of the way they think, the inflexibility of the way they act, the inflexibility of where they, uh, what they attend to. That feeds back into the emotion avoidance, which then creates more emotion inflexibility. And so then they're stuck in this state of, of avoiding emotions. So that's what that uh, that's the model that's presented in the anxiety and depression workbook. Mm -hmm. And the lever there is self-efficacy. The more the that you feel like you could change is. things and you could tolerate your emotional experience, the more that's likely right. you approach and the, and right. the affect will negative affect yeah. will so decrease. We move into kind of enhancing a flexibility of your thinking, of your actions, of what you attend to in the service of, you know, doing emotion exposure. Down the end. So it, it, it's mapped out like that. We start all with all of that earlier stuff that's really focused on self-efficacy to get the person, help the person be more willing to actually approach their emotional state. Mm -hmm. And that's where they really start to learn. Um, and and uh, the book that, that is, is coming out, is that a self-help book or is that for clinic? It is yes, self-help book. This, the Anxiety and Depression Workbook is a self-help book for adults. I also have another self-help book coming out uh, in November uh, for teens, and it's um, zero to 60, and it's a uh, help, self-help book for teens with uh, reactive prop anger difficulties. Um, and I just uh, signed a, a contract to kind of do a variation of the anxiety uh, and depression workbook um, that I did, that I completed for adults for teens. So that hopefully will come out next year sometime. Oh, great. And if people want to pre-order uh, the book we talked about today or the zero to 60, can they do that yet? Yes, they can order it. <clears throat> they can pre-order zero to 60 or they can actually order it right now. You can, they can do Barnes and Noble. They can do um, Amazon. Similarly, they can, they can't order the uh, anxiety and depression workbook yet. It's not been listed up on, on the sales sites yet. Okay. And um, as soon as that comes available, let me know and I'll put the link in the uh, session, uh, the session notes, the uh, podcast True. notes. <laughs> um, True. And so people can, can access that. Um, and if people want to follow what you're up to, maybe uh, see some things that you're writing about, or even if they want to come see you for therapy, how can they, how can they get, uh, get in touch or find more information about you? Probably the best way to uh, get information about um, me and the center here is um, to go to www.sfbact.com. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, San Francisco Bay Area Center for Cognitive Therapy. Um, other people who are interested in cognitive behavior therapy definitely could go to the Beck Institute website, uh, beckinstitute.org. Um, people who, with OCD who are interested in, you know, um, evidence-based treatments for OCD, the IOCDF.org website is a good one. And then, of course, um, Anxiety and Depression uh, Association of America, um, uh, ADAA is another great uh, website for information. Okay. I'll tag those all um, in, in the podcast notes as well. Okay, wonderful. Um, this has okay. been totally cool. Thanks a lot, Jason. No, thanks so much for coming on and um, we'll keep in touch. All right. Absolutely. Take good care. Bye-bye. Pleasure.